At any one time, I have a list of technologies that I'm watching, and it changes all the time. And I've always been being asked, you know, uh, what, uh, what, technology, what, what technologies uh, do you think are interesting and, and worth watching? And it's basically my job to, uh, to maintain this list anyway. So, um, so it is actually a, a physical list that sits in my Dropbox. Um, and uh, I present it once a year at our Technology Frontiers event, which happens in March in London. And, uh, and so I'm going to show you the, the list that I did this year. Now, this is a room full of very, very smart people in you know, the greatest tech hub in the world. So um, the reason I'm showing you this is I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. I want you to tell me what is not on the list and ought to be on the list. So let's have a look. Um, the idea of, of all of these is this, uh, we've heard this quote from Gibson. You can't have a tech conference without having this quote from Gibson. Um, future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, it's, the wording of this varies slightly, actually, this quote, because uh, he, he never wrote it down. He said it in a radio interview, and so uh, it's not quite clear uh, exactly what the wording is. Uh, but the basic idea is if you look in the right places, you can see glimpses of the future now. The canonical example is uh, mobile phones uh, used by Japanese schoolgirls in the year 2000. Uh, they had color screens and cameras, and you could download apps onto them, and you know, people went to Japan to look at them and go, look, look what they're doing. In the future, we'll all do this. And funnily enough, we did. So the idea is if you, if you can find the Japanese schoolgirl example, and uh, Wired actually used to have a column called Japanese schoolgirl watch, which sounded a bit dodgy, if you ask me. But uh, <laughs> the basic idea was that what Japanese schoolgirls do today, you will all do tomorrow, um, was, was fair enough. So that's one part of it. The other one is, uh, is Paul Sappho, um, who's here somewhere, I believe. Um, uh, this idea, we heard a version of this from Naveen as well. Most ideas take 20 years to become an overnight success. So not only are bits of the future sitting around already if you know where to look, but um, in fact, they have to be sitting around for quite a long time before you can spot them. Three, uh, again, three examples. 10 years ago, in fact, a bit more than 10 years ago, at the turn of the century, you could get a phone that you could download apps onto. Again, only Japanese schoolgirls really had them. Uh, you could get music players, digital music players. Before the iPod, they did exist. I remember there was a Sony one, the shape of a pen. And you plug your headphones into it. And I got very funny looks um, from people on the tube. What the hell is that? Listening to music out of a pen? Well, that's what it was. It was a digital music player. So they did exist. Um, and uh, uh, well, sorry, smartphones. There's another one as well. I can't remember what it is. Anyway, the point is that there are, there are things. Oh, social networks. That's right. Friendster existed then. Hardly anyone used it. Um, but the, these things, uh, the, they do take a, a while to sort of turn into a form that uh, becomes mass adopted. This is my current list now. So let's, uh, let's go through these technologies that I think are kind of stuff that crazy people are doing, not necessarily Japanese schoolgirls, but uh, 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 some crazy people are doing that potentially are uh, of wider interest. So let's start with this um, digital manufacturing, 3D printing. We heard from from Chris Anderson about this earlier on. I think there is a there there. Uh, the actual number of these devices being, being shipped is pretty small, but the, uh, the trends are interesting. If you look at the proportion of output from digital, from 3D printers uh, that isn't prototyping, because this has all been used in prototyping for years and years and years, if you look at the number of components that are actually used in anger, it's going up. So it's now north of about 20% of the output of these machines. This is typically on the great big you know, $500,000 machines that can print metal. Uh, but you can do some very, very cool things. For example, if you are printing the strut of an airplane um, and you want it to have a sort of foamy um, texture inside the strut like bone, it makes it much, much stronger, much, much lighter. You cannot make a part like that using traditional machining, using subtractive manufacturing, but you can print it. You can print it with a 3D printer that prints metal. Um, and uh, that's, that's the sort of thing that's starting to happen. These things are not just being used for prototyping and not just being used by Chris Anderson to print out uh, Darth Vader heads. Um, they are also being used to make actual useful products, and the proportion of the uh, output that's going into useful products is going up. The other thing I think that is uh, always a sign that a technology is worth keeping an eye on is when people start complaining about it. And uh, we've already had the fuss about the, um, uh, the guy who's printing these plastic guns, and they're not really, it's a part of the gun, and um, the gun only you know, works for a bit, and then it stops working. And anyway, there are much easier ways of getting hold of guns, especially in this country. But um, the fact that people are talking about, uh, uh, about this at all is, is interesting, because uh, that's a, you know, when you get an immune reaction uh, to a technology, that usually tells you that, um, uh, that uh, if people don't like it, then it's probably significant enough that they're bothering to complain about it. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the things about this. And then there's also this question, I think, of whether we end up with a sort of uh, Napster of objects. Will we get piracy of objects? Um, Lego, as you can appreciate, is very worried about this. Uh, but they have a team, I am told, that is working on 3D printing. And what they're essentially trying to do is figure out how they can make this their friend. They did this very successfully with Mindstorms. You may recall that Mindstorms is this canonical example of where the, uh, the Mindstorms software was really bad and really slow, and a bunch of people at MIT reverse engineered it and made it much better and much faster. And um, Lego initially said, hey, you shouldn't do that, copyright. Uh, and then they said, you know what? Your software is much better. Let's use yours. So um, they are trying to do the same kind of jujitsu with 3D printing, and they're trying to work out how they can um, 
they can, you know, uh, work in a world where 3D printers are ubiquitous and people can print out components. This uh, looks like this is actually a 3D printed car here. You can see the kind of um, uh, you know, the characteristic ridges. And this is quite an old. This is from a machine sort of three or four years ago. Things have got a lot better here. The resolutions got better. Um, it is not, however, the 100% scale of Lego technical Lego. So if you're used to technical Lego, this is actually at I think 200% scale. Um, so this gives you a slightly misleading example of how fine the resolution is. But you know, this stuff gets better and better. So definitely worth looking at. Um, another thing worth looking at is the uh, Staples experiment, which I think, so Staples is putting 3D printers into uh, a whole bunch of its stores in the Netherlands. And the idea is you can take a disc down there or a, a, a flash stick and, um, and print stuff out. That will reveal if there is massive latent demand for 3D printing. Maybe there isn't, but it'll be interesting to find out. Okay, self-driving cars, we've heard about these. Again, interesting because um, uh, regulation, people are starting to, to think about regulation. We're actually gonna get the first examples um, on sale this year. Not totally self-driving, but the thing to remember about self-driving cars is it's a continuum. So uh, we don't go straight to the Google, it does everything car. Um, essentially more and more of the job of, of, of driving gets outsourced to the car. So you can already get cars that park themselves. You can already get cars that slam on the brakes. You can already get cars that do lane keeping. Um, if you put all these things together and you have a car that does lane keeping and, uh, and has an adaptive cruise control that maintains a constant distance from the car in front, you've got a car that can drive itself in stop-go traffic. And the first car that can do that is looks like it's going to go on sale at the end of this year. It's a BMW, um, and essentially you'll be able to sit there on the uh, uh, on the 101, and it will just um, you know get on with it itself. And then when the traffic starts moving again, you can you can drive it. So there's going to be a continuum here. This is going to be a gradual process, um, and there are going to be big regulatory issues. We touched on it just now, but um, but uh, but I think this is definitely something worth watching. I, I'm also very interested to see what Google's strategy is here. I mean, you need something like Street View to make this work. So are they looking to license a sort of Android style Android for cars? I don't know. It's very, very interesting. Drones. We're going to have drones doing our microphones here. Five years. Yeah, I think we are. Again, drones in, uh, are interesting because um, people are starting to worry about them. They're starting to say, hang on a minute, the, the police, is the, you know, are they allowed to use them? Um, we have activists using them to film the police at protests. And uh, the police say, you're not allowed to do that. And the, and the activists saying, why? We have Japanese environmental uh, activists using their uh, drones, actually using fixed wing drones, um, to take pictures of, of whaling ships. Um, and so people are starting to say, hang on a minute, and uh, you know, we're gonna get down to insect sized drones. I mean, there are already insect sized drones out there, some on Kickstarter even. Um, when you could fly an insect into a, you know, a Hollywood celebrity's house and take pictures of them, then you know, we're gonna get some serious lawmaking taking place. Um, my favorite example is Texas actually wants to make drone photography illegal. And the reason it does is that it infringed um, the, uh, the privacy of a company that was illegally dumping waste into a river. And someone took pictures of this with a drone by mistake, actually. They weren't even looking for it. And uh, the, the company got fined by the EPA. And its response was to go to the state and say, we need to ban photography from drones. Anyway, when you start having arguments like this, it means that something is going on with this technology. Um, here, is a very, here is a very interesting chart. Um, this shows you how much better gene sequencing is getting than Moore's law. Um, so the, the next of my uh, uh, technologies to watch is this $1,000 genome. We're not quite there yet. It still costs about three dollars to $5,000 to sequence a genome. And there's a legal fight going on over the um, intellectual property relating to nanopore sequencing, which is holding up the, the final drop to 1,000. So if you look at the far right of that chart, you can see the last two data points are at the same height. And that's essentially the consequence of this, uh, of this legal fight. And what this shows you is that um, you can, you you can actually sequence a full genome pretty quickly. You can do it in about 48 hours now, um, and for yeah, three to five thousand uh, dollars. The first genome that was sequenced was the you know the Human Genome Project, cost a billion dollars, took a decade. So things have got very much faster, very much better. And in fact, they've got it's got better faster than the computers are getting better to, to process the data. So this is turning into a software problem. It's turning into a big data problem. Um, the British government has just announced this plan. It's going to sequence uh, 100,000 genomes uh, for a thousand dollars each. So that's sorry for a thousand pounds each. So that's a hundred million pounds and. It's then going to do lots and lots of full genome comparisons, and it's going to, you know, this is what it wants to do. Um, and its bet is that the median price of the single sequence will fall into a thousand um, pounds during the uh, the 10-year the uh, cycle of, the, of of that program. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But uh, anyway, I think this is very much worth looking at. Um, full genome comparisons could potentially lead to new diagnostics. You know, we could work out uh, how how to make drugs more effective. That would be great. We'd also share, shed a light on human evolution, which would be quite interesting. Um, and it also totally blows up the health insurance industry because if you can identify who are the high risks at birth, then they become uninsurable. And then you have to have compulsory risk pooling and then you have to have socialized medicine. Sorry, <laughs> you just have to have it. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, so 
Um, so I think that's, that's all one to watch because it has all of these interesting knock-on effects. Uh, gene therapy, this is a, a new addition to the list this year. Um, gene therapy is interesting because uh, it, you know, it, was the, it was the next big thing in, in the late 90s. And then they had these early trials uh, that went wrong and people died. Um, and the reason they died was that the, the viruses that were used to put the genes um, into them for the therapy uh, caused a, an adverse reaction. It wasn't the actual genes, it was the viruses used to, to, to put them in. Um, but uh, uh, this put everyone off, the whole idea of gene, th gene therapy. You know, the big pharma ran away from it. Uh, researchers really didn't want to do trials. However, it's been making a steady comeback. So the first gene therapy called Glybera was uh, approved by European regulators in November. The FDA is going to approve its first gene therapy this year. Um, and so uh, th uh, there, there have been some amazing studies. There was, a, there was one study where um, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, was cured in dogs using uh, a single treatment of, of gene therapy, which is ex extraordinary, um, using viral vectors just to carry new genes into, into the body. Um, there have been uh, similarly studies where people have been completely cured of leukemia. Now, it's not everyone on the trial, um, and some people aren't cured by it, but... Um, you know, there are some amazing results coming. So this is turning into a field that people were scared to get involved with, too, something very exciting. Um, now, of course, this opens a massive transhumanist can of worms, because if we get used to the idea of using this for, for therapy, then the next thing we can start doing is using it for self-modification. Um, if you've read Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, you may recall that uh, uh, you know, people start doing this as a sort of fashion thing. They, uh, I remember one of them modifies herself so she can purr like a cat. Um, and other people modify themselves so they have wings. And, uh, you know, so tattoos, are, you know, just wait till that crowd gets hold of gene therapy. It's, it's going to be <laughs> great fun. Um, so that's, that's, this is really, I think, something to watch. That This is something that, that a lot of people, in fact, the more you knew about it, the more inclined you were to write it off. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's coming back. Yay, we've got to have, we've got to have um, the, the, the glasses. Don't you think he looks like a pirate when he's wearing these? Um, uh, so this, this, uh, this picture rec represents the... Uh, the field of wearable computing. It's very clear that computers are getting smaller and closer to our bodies. Um, you know, they've gone into our pockets. Uh, many of you will be wearing those uh, you know, wristbands that, that track your health, that sort of thing. Uh, glasses is next, um, then implants, or contact lenses. You know, uh, The sci-fi crowd have figured all of this out. Um, so I think wearables are very interesting for that reason. Um, and uh, you know, people are already raising the sort of privacy implications and, and security implications of, of uh, having cameras built into glasses and you can't tell whether people are filming you or not and you can't even tell if they're listening to you or not. Um, and for this sort of thing, you know, I won't need a piece of paper like this, I can just have my notes here. Um, it's the future calling again. Um, one of the interesting things you'll be able to do, you know, glass can't do this yet, but uh, is you know, overlaying with augmented reality. Now, to do that, we're going to need to do proper head tracking, and we're going to need indoor positioning. Indoor positioning is the thing that is you know, the real, real problem here. You need to have millimeter level indoor positioning. It looks like the best way to do that is actually to use vision technology maps of the insides of buildings. Um, Apple just acquired a company that does indoor positioning, which I think is a, uh, not, a, not a surprise, because that's what, uh, this is the sort of thing they're thinking of. Um, so uh, wearables, I think, is definitely uh, a trend worth watching the next couple of years. Um, mobile payments is one of those areas that, uh, you know, surely, surely someone's got to sort this out. Square, um, interesting to see how the, uh, the whole Starbucks thing will go. But um, essentially, there's a dam waiting to break here. Uh, it's incredibly old-fashioned. When I get checks sent over from the US, I have to take them to my bank, and they go in an envelope, and they go back to the US, and it takes two weeks, and I get a terrible exchange rate. And, you know, it's like the 19th century. It's absolutely terrible. So um, there's clearly a, a need for new technologies to, to sort this out. I don't think NFC is the answer. The joke doing the rounds in Barcelona at the um, MWC show was that NFC, these chips in your phone, stands for not for consumers. Uh, no one seems to be interested in it. Um, the sharing economy. We did a cover on this in The Economist the other day, um, which I wrote. And uh, again, you know, one of the reasons you can tell this is serious is that the tax people are going, hang on a minute, you should be paying hotel taxes in, um, in San Francisco if you're on Airbnb. Uh, that only happens when uh, something is big enough to pay attention to. Also, the incumbents are moving in. So uh, GE has a stake in relay rides, and Avis has bought uh, Zipcar, which has a stake in wheels. And so you know, when, when big companies are hedging by buying into a market, that tells you they think there's something there. Um, Wireless charging, uh, again, something that people have been trying to do for a while. This is interesting. This is an Apple patent uh, where they use a zone, uh, nuclear magnetic, sorry, it's not nuclear magnetic. It's called near field magnetic resonance. Um, so essentially, it would, uh, it would power your keyboard and your mouse from your iMac. But if your iPhone was nearby as well, it would charge that too. Um, this could be one of those fields like GUIs and MP3 players and smartphones and tablets where Apple comes along and says, hey, everyone who's been doing this really badly for the last 10 years, this is how you should do it. And they keep doing that. So maybe they'll do it in wireless charging. And finally, 
uh, my tenth technology is, um, is space startups. I wonder whether we'll look back at the, uh, the period that we're living through now, and we'll go, oh, yes, you know, from sort of 2050, 2070, and we'll say, yes, there was a terrible economic crisis. Um, we all got smartphones for the first time, and there were all those guys building spaceships. Why didn't we notice? Um, when I first met Elon Musk a decade ago, I thought he was absolutely crazy. Um, he said he was going to build these rockets, and he was going to go to Mars. And every time I see him, he seems a bit less crazy. Um, and he's, you know, this is a, this is a real, this is one of his actual spacecraft. He has this contract with NASA, sending stuff to the space station. Um, you know, this stuff is real, and uh, there are more people doing it. And you know, he, he really does want to go to Mars. So uh, if somebody seems a bit less crazy every time you see them, I think that's quite a, uh, an interesting metric. Um, anyway, so those are my 10 technologies. Uh, what I really want to know, though, is why I'm wrong. So tell me what I should have had. Tell me uh, what ought to have been on the list. Uh, I've already had a couple of suggestions today. Um, someone said real-time translation. That's going to be a really big deal when you can just talk to anyone in the world without having to worry about a language barrier. Uh, someone else said aquaponics. Um, what about this whole, you know, growing stuff, fish and, and uh, plants and, uh, you know, together and having a big closed, uh, closed loop? Someone else said uh, fourth-generation nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear power reactors. There's a big fan club out there for thorium reactors. It's one of those things that, uh, like Zeppelins and Nikola Tesla that has a big geek fan club. So, so who knows? So tell me, please, and help me improve my list of the top 10 technologies to watch. Thank you.